In this presentation we shall do three things. 1. We shall dispute two assertions of quantum mechanics. 2. We shall compare three theories about quantum entanglement. And lastly, we will talk about Bell's theory. Without any further ado, let's get started. First, let's make sure you understand these three things. The act of measurement changes the current state of an electron. Two fermions in close proximity must have opposite orientation. Superposition is a theoretical assumption that is used to describe all possible state of a quantum particle when the actual state of the particle is unknown or the particle is not under measurement. For this video, we have replaced the electron with this yellow ball, the spin-up orientation of the electron with an apple, and the spin-down orientation with an orange. The horizontal arrow is used to represent angular momentum. The flashlight has been used to represent a measuring device, while the rays of light is used to represent the act of measurement. This following argument will show that this assertion you've just seen is not true. It is the assertion of quantum mechanics that the result of a particle in a state of superposition is based on probability. In other words, we cannot know the result until it is measured. But look at this two entangled electrons. Quantum mechanics asserts that the spin of this two entangled electrons are in a state of superposition. So let's measure the first particle. Based on our measurement, the first entangled particle is in a spin-up state. Notice that the second entangled particle has not yet been measured, which means it is still in a state of superposition. However, I can tell you with 100% certainty that when we measure it, the result will be spin-down. Assume you argue that entangled particles are exempt from this assertion, this argument will only help to prove that there is a clause missing in the assertion of quantum mechanics. Otherwise, based on this demonstration, the popular assertion which states that the result of a particle in a state of superposition depends on probability, cannot be true. This following argument will show that this popular assertion you've just read is not true. It is the assertion of quantum mechanics that the act of measuring one entangled particle forces the other entangled pair to choose a specific orientation when it is measured. But, consider this two entangled electrons that are about to undergo measurement. Let's measure the first electron. The orientation is spin down. It is a popular assertion by majority of physicists that the act of measuring this particle and the particle choosing a spin down state is what forced the other entangled pair into making a spin up decision when we measure it later. Though, there's no reasonable explanation of how this happened, many have accepted it as the truth. Now, let's reverse the measurement we made on the first particle and watch it again. But, wait, instead of measuring one particle at a time, this time, we shall measure both particles simultaneously. The result of both particles are not surprising because, before we measured them, we know they are entangled. But, notice that because we measured both particles simultaneously, there's no way one can reasonably argue that it is the measurement made on one particle that determined the outcome of the other. If that doesn't convince you, let me take my proof one step further. This two electrons has just interacted. 
we know because of this interaction, they will be entangled when they separate. Now, let's separate them. Wait. Before we separate them, do you know multiple electrons can be entangled? Yes, it is possible. Therefore, let's add three more electrons to this too. Now, let's separate the electrons and label them from A to E. In this experiment, I want to know the spin of particle B. So I measured its pair on the left. Because the result of particle A is spin up, I know that the result of particle B will be spin down when I measure it later. But, that's not the only result I know. As a matter of fact, because I know the result of particle A, I can tell you the result of the remaining particles, including particle E that never directly interact with particle A. Based on empirical, testable, and demonstrable protocol, the physics behind the arrangement of these spin orientations which allows me to know that the spin orientation of particle E is spin up, even before I measured it is based on the Pauli exclusion principle, not a mysterious enforcement imposed by particle A. If you are a little arrogant like myself, you can argue that perhaps, I don't understand how entanglement works, even though I doubt if you can logically explain how the act of measuring particle A forced particle E to make a decision. But here is how I'm going to end this argument. You can argue that the deity you believe is infinite, and I can argue that the universe is infinite. You can argue that the deity you believe is present everywhere, and I can argue that space is present everywhere. You can argue that the deity you worship was not created and I can also argue that what led to the Big Bang was not created. You can argue that the measurement made on particle A mysteriously forced particle E to make a decision, and I can argue that the Pauli exclusion principle is responsible for the arrangement of the spin orientation we see when we measured the five electrons. The major difference between both arguments will be that, my argument is based on obvious logic, while yours is based on a popular belief. In this segment, I'll explain quantum entanglement according to the view of quantum mechanics, according to the view of Albert Einstein, and according to my view which I refer to as the fundamental variable theory. Lastly, I will talk about Bell's theory, and the method used by three scientists to back up the theory. According to the popular interpretation of quantum mechanics view on quantum entanglement, because this two electron emerged from a single source, they are entangled. In other words, angular momentum must be conserved. Quantum mechanics asserts that while these electrons are separated, their spin orientations are in a state of superposition, meaning they have no definite spin orientation until they are measured. When one of this particle is measured, and the spin orientation is known, quantum mechanics claims that this act of measurement and the fact that this particle collapse is what somehow forces the other entangled electron to choose the opposite orientation when it is measured. According to the popular interpretation of Albert Einstein view on quantum entanglement, because this two electron emerged from a single source, they are entangled. In other words, angular momentum must be conserved. Albert Einstein believes that, regardless of whether or not the spin orientation are in a state of superposition, before and while these electrons are separated, the electrons contains a determined spin orientation which will later be revealed during measurement. So that when we measure both particles later, the result we see are the spin orientation which had been chosen from the moment both electrons separated. According to the fundamental variable theory view on quantum entanglement, because this two electron emerged from a single source, they are entangled. In other words, due to Pauli exclusion principle, angular momentum must be conserved. This theory asserts that, while this two electrons are separated, angular momentum is conserved. Yet, the spin orientation of both particles are in a state of superposition. By this we mean, spin-angular momentum is fundamental, meaning, 
it stays in the same direction until it experiences a collapse, while spin orientation is not fundamental, meaning, it doesn't exist or specify a direction until the moment of measurement. This theory further asserts that when this entangled particles are measured, the angular momentum will collapse into the opposite direction, therefore revealing the opposite of the spin state that was there before. The Bell's theorem is a mathematical demonstration that was formulated based on Albert Einstein and quantum mechanics view on quantum entanglement. It's important to note that in theory, the bone of contention in this views which the Bell's theorem intentionally or unintentionally focused his formulation on is the spin orientation. This is why, majority of the physical experiments which has been carried out using Bell's formulation, made use of the manipulations of spin orientation by randomly changing the angle of the measuring device. In my opinion, none of the three views above suggest that the angle of spin orientation will not be affected by a measuring device. If the EPR actually mean the vector of spin orientation cannot be affected by a measuring device, then the statement is wrong. It is true that light travels in a straight line, yet, since light travels through space, one must expect that light will follow the curvature of space. However, this doesn't in fact disprove locality. It only dispute Albert Einstein's view of locality, leaving a space for someone else to propose another view of locality. The way to disprove a theory or an hypothesis is by providing concrete evidence of how the phenomenon in question works. Unfortunately, no one is yet to explain the physics behind locality or non-locality. The test I proposed in the other video on this channel to test the view of the fundamental theory on quantum entanglement should only be used for the electrons or atoms.